just, you know, Mr. Shuckman brought up that the student had come up to him and said, I feel like I'm coming to prison every day. Okay, and I know some of you probably feel like that. Um, the social aspect of what we normally get from school has been greatly diminished. Um, and that's harder for some, some kids than others to deal with. So um, it's just, it's where we're at right now. Our numbers are really good um, as far as cases go in Kansas, uh, in Cedric County, the, the numbers are down. Um, now we're not going to rush back. I think, you know, to, um, everybody coming back, we're not going to rush into that, but it is a goal. Uh, if you have younger siblings at feeder schools, they're going every day, right? Um, so, I mean, it's something that I think administration and the, the come on, man. And the uh, diocese wants, but we just need to do it safely. Now, I don't know if you guys heard about Andover Central football team last Friday. They were getting ready to play a game. Um, and, you know, their opponent was getting ready to travel to their, to their uh, stadium. And one of the Andover Central kids got COVID. And so... They canceled everything, okay? So, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to avoid is, you know, a shutdown where we go all remote, okay? As you guys know that. So, um, this thing, I don't know if the battery did. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so, uh, take care of yourselves. Stand up for yourselves um, if you feel like you're being overwhelmed, okay? This is, uh, you know... This is new for teachers, too. Okay, so, and some teachers, from what I heard from my house today, aren't doing a very good job, or first hour told me they're not doing a very good job um, of posting things where you can see them and that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, make sure you communicate, all right? Same thing with me. Um, now, like I said, I'm not giving you a bunch of stuff out of class at this point. So, uh, really, all we're doing is learning. And... The last thing I covered uh, in the last session was uh, the Green New Deal and taxes, okay? Uh, so that takes us to number uh, 15, and we're going to try to get through at least three, maybe four today. Yeah? So on the video on YouTube, I couldn't hear what the video that you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. I just really found it. I just yeah. found it. Yeah. I, I tried to read what you said, and I found it on YouTube. Oh. If you could do this, say, say that again. I'm just like, we like, said, like, 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 you were watching a video, the ones that you showed on a video. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't watch any of them. What's that? Yeah, yeah, I can find them. Yeah, for the Green New Deal. Okay, shoot. And that might be YouTube censoring me. I don't know. No, we just well, can't hear it. It's just We can yeah, hear it, yeah. Like from, the, from your speaker to the... Wow. Okay. The first video, the whole first video, and like half the video, I couldn't hear it. Nothing. And then like the second half of the last video, I could like perfectly hear it. Okay. Yeah, I can send those out. Oh, and then also there's like four videos. Like there's only you and I. Okay, yeah, I need to... I'm going to try and pin this, but I don't know if it'll work. I don't think, even though this is what, you're, it's a full screen, I don't think it's recording as a full screen. Well, I just, I just, you know, the live yeah, stream, and it shows me full screen. Okay. I don't know if this Well, I was at a golf tournament, so I came back, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then, like, when yeah, I watched yeah, the yeah. YouTube, Okay. Hate, uh, hate crime legislation, okay? Let's talk about that. Um, so... Uh, Hate crime would be a, a crime that was committed against somebody for, and really this started with sexual orientation, so against homosexual people, uh, but it's extended now to uh, religious minorities um, or just against a religion. Um, doesn't have to be a minority religion. Uh, it could be gender. It could be um, race. Okay, so race, religion sexual orientation okay um 
Now, the, the, these laws really came out of a case in Wyoming about 20 years ago. Uh, and there was an individual, his name was Matthew Shepard. I don't know if any of you guys heard that name before. But Matthew Shepard was a gay man, and he was living in Wyoming, and he went into a bar. And there was these two guys, uh, which you might consider kind of like redneck guys, pickup truck and so forth. And they figured out that Bill, uh, what's his name? Matthew Shepard was, um, was gay, and um, they convinced him to go with them uh, in their truck, and they took him out to a remote area and beat him to death, and he died. Okay, uh, Matthew Shepard became kind of the, uh, the news for weeks. Um, and so out of that came hate crime legislation which would add additional penalties to a crime if it were committed out of that type of hate towards a religion, sexual orientation, and so forth, okay, race. And so um, basically what happens is it becomes, it can become a federal crime, like a civil rights violation, okay? So you're talking about stiffer penalties for these types of crime, okay? Now I'm going to give you a hypothetical. All right. You guys know every year when we play Northwest in football, uh, they like to come over and put a T-shirt on Jesus out front, right? And some people get offended by that. Personally, I think it's kind of funny. It's kind of harmless. But uh, let's say they spray painted on the side of the school in big letters, Bishop Carroll stinks. Okay. So what's what's the crime that has been committed here? Vandalism, maybe trespassing, something like that. Okay. Now let's change what they write on the on the on the school. They write uh, Catholics stink. Okay. Uh, or you could go with something a little more vulgar against Catholics, right? But just change the word from Bishop Carroll to Catholic. Okay. And what's the crime? Vandalism, trespassing. Do we want to create another? penalty in addition to that because it was against a religion, okay? Uh, let me give you another hypothetical. A white guy and a black guy get in a fight, okay? Now, the reason this fight starts is because the black guy said something nasty about the white guy's mom, and he's going to defend his mother's honor, okay? But in the course of the fight, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight, but adrenaline spikes, like, big time, Okay? And in the course of that fight, the white guy called the black guy the N-word, and a bystander heard it. And so the cops come, and they arrest you, and they say, well, you were beating up this black guy because he was black. Okay. Is this what we want government to do? Now, in a case of somebody drawing a swastika on a Jewish synagogue or leaving a slab of bacon, at the front door of a mosque, okay, you can see how that would be considered a hate crime, yes? Now, those are religious minorities, okay? So, it becomes difficult to figure out what a perpetrator was thinking, unless it's very obvious, while that crime was being committed. Now, in the case of Matthew Shepard, about five years after this all went down, there was an author that looked into this case. And the author himself was gay. So he's got some credibility here. Okay? Because what he found was Matthew Shepard was actually dealing meth. And that well, he was most likely killed not because he was gay, but over a drug deal gone wrong. Okay, but the media obviously portrayed this in one way. So that book comes out five years later. Did the media report on that for two weeks? No. In fact, a lot of the media ignored it. Okay, because that's not what they wanted people to hear. Okay. So it can become a, a situation where the police or the prosecutors trying to figure out what was going through somebody's mind when they committed a crime which could lead to, you know, like, mistakes. Yes? Thought crime. Say it again? Thought crime. Cop crime? Thought crime. Thought crime. Yes, possibly. I mean, really, uh, mind reading here. 
what was somebody thinking when they did it, right? And so this is, uh, there were two girls, uh, two college white girls. And where did the Democrats hold their convention? I don't know if it was Delaware or wherever they did it, because it wasn't like a normal convention. It was, it was all like on Zoom um, and stuff like that. So um, there was some Republican pro-Trump supporters outside of the Democratic convention. And these two college girls, white college girls, came out. And they, uh, they got into a verbal altercation, which became physical. And I think they pushed the dad, and there was a seven-year-old boy there, okay? And the, the, there was a MAGA hat, and the girls took the MAGA hat, and you can hear the mom on the video say, hey, that's not yours. And she told the seven-year-old to go get the hat from these girls. And then one of the girls shoved the seven-year-old and then threw the hat over a fence. Well, they have these girls on video. They have been charged with hate crimes. Okay, now, I don't approve of anybody you know, using violence in a political situation, but do we really want to charge those girls with hate crimes? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that, that could be a federal crime. Okay, so I, I don't know if this is the road you want to go down. Does it, however, if people know, how, do you, how many guys knew about hate crimes before I started talking about it? Okay, because a lot of ignorant people that commit hate crimes don't even know these laws exist. So do these laws prevent hate crimes from taking place? Well, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Okay, is it a good preventative measure? You decide. Okay. All right. Uh, next. Okay, defend Taiwan against China. Raise your hand if you think if I gave you a blank map, you could pick out where Taiwan is. Okay. Can you describe where it might be? Isn't it like, I just don't know what's over there. Um, it's like southeast of China, I guess. Yes. Like, like right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is where Taiwan is, all right? Now, I gotta give you some history, all right? So during World War II, okay, we were on the side of the Soviet Union. This was against Hitler, the Nazis, right? Uh, and also against the Japanese, yes? And Italy for a while, right? Yes? Okay, so in 1931, Japan invaded China, Manchuria, up here, okay? And then throughout the whole next 10 years, really 15 years, China penetrated further and further and further into China. You guys, as you'll learn next semester, the Chinese were very, excuse me, the Japanese were very brutal to the Chinese. Okay? I mean, stuff I can't even talk about in class. Okay, so when the war was over, we were fighting on the side of China. We were helping the China because we were fighting the Japanese. Yes? So we were helping the Chinese, and their leader at the time was a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek. He was our friend. He was a dictator. Not a great guy, but he was our guy. Okay. When the war ended in 1945, there was a revolution in China, led by the communists, led by a guy named Mao Zedong. Okay, or we just call him Mao, General Mao. And Mao defeated Chiang Kai-shek. The communists won. Okay? Chiang Kai-shek fled to the island nation of Taiwan, formerly known as Formosa. Okay? And, and he took the remnants of his army with him and his wife and family. And over time, Madam Chiang took over when Chiang Kai-shek died. And she democratized Taiwan. Okay? She, they had free elections. They became independent or declared independence from China. They have the same culture, the same language, the same history. This, this island has always been part of China. Okay? But now they're a free nation. They have free speech. They have free religion. Okay? And
And China, since that day, has said they want it back. So since the 1950s, the United States has pledged to defend Taiwan against China. Every year, Congress passes a resolution stating so, that we will defend Taiwan. Okay, now China, over the last couple of decades, has gotten very rich. Their economy has grown very much. And we help them do that because we buy all the stuff they make. Yes? Their military has gotten a lot stronger. So over the last couple of decades, they started to threaten Taiwan more. Now, Taiwan doesn't want this independence. They do not like say, no, 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 you know, they don't do that because they don't want to raise the ire of China, which is much bigger and stronger. Now, Taiwan has a good military. They have good technology because they buy it from us, military technology. And if China were to uh, try to do invade Taiwan, they would have to do it so amphibiously, which is difficult to do. Okay, that strait is more than, like, it's like 70 miles. That's a long way of water, okay? So Taiwan could conceivably defend itself with the help of the United States Navy. This would not be a battle fought on Chinese soil. That would be crazy, okay? They have a billion more people than we do. Okay, this would most likely be a naval and air battle. Does China have the technology to take out our aircraft carrier? Yes. Okay, so Americans no doubt would die. We would lose some of our neighbors. I don't know how much, but we would lose some of our neighbors for sure. Okay, people are going to die. Now, back in the mid-90s, China was doing military exercises off the coast and lofting missiles off the coast of Taiwan. Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, sent the U.S. 7th Fleet with an aircraft carrier force through the Strait of Taiwan between China and Taiwan to say, ah, 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 not so fast. We will defend China. Okay. Now, President uh, Bush, Obama, and I really haven't heard Trump speak to this, but are a little bit less, you know, than Clinton here. You know, I mean, Clinton's, you know, I'm, I mean, to send the fleet right through here is like pounding our chest a little bit. You know what I mean? So, Taiwan is a friend. They're an ally, they're a trading partner, they're a dem democratic nation in the Far East, like Japan is today. These are our friends. South Korea, okay, which is up here. That is our friend, that is our ally. Okay, if we do not defend Taiwan, who will? Is Russia going to step in? And is, is Spain going to do something? I mean, like, who's going to do something? Because this is the this is the reality of the United States in post World War II. It's the new world order. We have become the policemen of the world, and at times that's drawn us into some pretty heavy wars. Some people don't like that. They want to isolate ourselves and say, you know what? Let other people deal with their problems. But when you let that go too long, eventually that comes knocking on your door. Okay, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, something to pick, talk about. It is a situation that you in your lifetime or your kids may have to deal with. Okay, it is one of the threats in this world. So do you sacrifice American men and women for the defense of Taiwan if China tries to take it back by force? You decide. Sam? They do not have nuclear weapons. Like that, honestly, all of it sounds completely ridiculous and not really radical, but if you gave them one, China would probably not attack. Yep. No one would attack. Well, you have a point. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't 
sudden this really is getting too much. Yeah. You remember something called the Cuban Missile Crisis? Yeah. yeah. That almost led to nuclear war. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Now, we, guys, if, if China were to, like, nuke Taiwan, okay, then we would be probably respond. But I don't know. Depends on who's president. Okay. All right, we're gonna we've got to move on. Okay. Uh, against U.S. troops being placed under U.N. command. Okay. Now, guys, this is just kind of an ideological thing here. All right, I'm gonna talk about two things here: NATO and the United Nations. Oops. This. Bye bye. These are international organizations, but they're different. Very, very different. Okay. The United Nations was, you guys remember this, so the League of Nations, 1919, League of Nations, after World War I? We didn't join, remember? It was President Wilson's idea, but we didn't join. Okay. Uh, these are not military alliances, these are just friendly relations among nations. Okay. There's over 200 nations in the United Nations. Now, NATO, called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is a defensive alliance. It's a military alliance. There's about 25 countries in it. The United States is in it. We are the backbone of NATO. We are the strongest nation in the world. And the other countries that want to join with us as allies, which would include Canada, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Poland, Greece, Turkey. Okay, there's 25. And the whole reason for NATO was the Soviet Union. This is after World War II. And so this is a military alliance. If any of them are attacked, if any of those countries are attacked, all of them are attacked. So when we were attacked on 9-11, all of these NATO countries sent troops to Afghanistan with us. All of them. Okay? This is about peace. Or maintaining peace. Okay? And human rights and other things. Now, a lot of the United Nations, to me, is hypocritical. Okay? Because when you talk about human rights and religious liberty and... Uh, the treatment of women and stuff like that, right? That's what the United, they talk about all that stuff, but there's a lot of member countries that don't have those things. Now, when we joined in 1945, guys, we still had Jim Crow law. How were we doing? We were hypocrites as well, yes? Absolutely, okay? Well, there's a lot of countries like that right now that are hypocrites, okay? Um, so. To me, the United Nations, they do not have a military force. When they want to use troops, they ask nations to provide troops. Okay, they wear the uh, North Carolina blue, like the, the blue surgical mask. You guys are wearing that color blue helmets. Okay, that's the UN logo. Okay, and so we use peacekeepers to try and stop UN peacekeepers, which are multinational forces, troops from many different countries. Okay, and somebody's got to be in charge of that operation. Now, this one's in the news recently. Now, do I have some history students in here right now? Yeah, there's, there's my two. Okay. Um, remember, we talked about Serbia and Kosovo, uh, where they tried to ethnically cleanse. This is in the mid-90s, guys. And we talked about Rwanda. Okay, and some of you guys know about Rwanda, the Hotel Rwanda, the movie, the the butcher that these both of these things were taking place roughly the same time in the mid 90s where you had groups of people trying to commit genocide one in europe one in africa now militarily in europe we got involved now just from the air okay we used our air force well guys the christians in kosovo the serbs were trying to ethnically cleanse the muslims that means separate the men and the women kill the men rape the women, 
They bear your children, thus cleansing their ethnicity from your country. It's genocide. This is happening in Europe in 1995. It's horrible. Okay? The people who had their families and friends murdered, they haven't forgotten that. And they want revenge. You follow me? So the UN sends in peacekeepers. Same thing in Rwanda, where the Hutus and the Tutsis were going at. Okay? I know. Where almost a million people were butchered with machetes. Now we didn't send, we didn't do anything there. We didn't get involved there. Okay. But the UN did send peacekeepers to both of these places. Now somebody's gonna be in charge. Now, some parts of this world, guys, people love America. You go to Romania, they love America. You go to France, not so much. Okay. So in different parts of the world, you send a peacekeeping force in. You may not want an American commander. Okay? Maybe you have a Pakistani or an Indian commander or a French commander. Okay? And then the forces will be made up of many different nations. So back in the 90s, American peacekeepers were sent and they were placed under foreign command. And there were a couple of our troops that said, well, when we pledged we went into the U.S. military. We pledged to defend the Constitution against all foreign, foreign and domestic enemies and to take orders from our commanding officer. But we didn't sign up to take orders from an Indian commander. And so they refused, and they were court-martialed. Okay? I've had this thing on that list. It's just kind of an ideological thing. Should Americans be placed under foreign command with the U.N.? If it makes the operation run better, run better, if it's a French commander or of another country, is it that big of a deal? Or under on principle, you say, no, Americans should only be under American command. Okay, we're not just going to shop out our troops to, you know, to the UN and let somebody else command our people. Yeah. Are the peacekeepers legitimately volunteers? I think volunteers personally. Volunteer to the U.S. military and then shopped out to the U.N. So they were volunteers, not volunteers. Volunteers for the U.S. military. And you could say your commanding officer says, commands you to take orders from this guy from Pakistan. So you have to follow those orders. That's what they were saying. But they said, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. So it's pretty simple. You either think that's okay or it's not that big of a deal or on principle you disagree with. Just ask the question of like, is it, do they have an ability to like go from the U.S. military and volunteer to the U.N.? No, it's it's just like, okay, we the U.N. gets together and says we need a peacekeeping force. America, will you send us 100 soldiers? And then they say yes, and then they pick these hundred guys and say, you guys and gals, and you guys are going over there to be a peacekeeper. That's it. Volunteering would literally remove this problem. Right. But who wants to do that? You want to go live in Rwanda? Live in Rwanda and actually bring peace to Right. There you go. Well, that's not on the thing. <laughs> Sam, you're a problem solver, but you got to choose here. Get off the fence. All right. Next, uh, opposed to bailouts for the auto industry and financial industries. This is the second hour. I got 20 minutes, 15 minutes to do this. Okay. Guys. Uh, I know you were born in like 2003 and stuff, and this happened in 2008 and 2009, okay? What I'm talking about. Now, we just talked about 9-11, so I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by bailout. One of you, and I don't know if it's this class or not, one of you had a family member that flew like five days after 9-11, okay? I'm like, wow, because I remember flying this September. I flew in January. 
by January 3rd, and people were still very nervous about flying. Yes? The airlines were shut down for, I think, three days. So the airline industry lost billions of dollars. Okay? And then not as many people were flying, kind of like right now, right, because of COVID. The airline industry is in deep doo-doo. Okay? So the government bails them out because a lot of the airlines were going to go under. So they gave them money. Whose money was that? It was our money. It was our taxpayer money. But when you want to be able to fly, you know, down the line, there's no airlines alive because, so they bail them out. Follow me? We've seen a heck of a lot of that because of COVID, businesses that are shuttered because of no fault of their own, because the government said shut down. So the government is loaning these people money, giving them money. That is not a bailout. Okay, this is different than what I'm about to talk about. It's similar though. Okay, so let me go back to 2008 and talk about General Motors or GM. Yes, yeah, they make cars. Yes, and in 2008, General Motors was in big trouble. Uh, 2009. This is really 2009. They're in big, big trouble. They're about to face bankruptcy. Okay, now there's 25,000. People that work for General Motors, and then you have all the dealerships that sell GM cars, and if they don't have any cars, they're going to go out of business. Okay, so you're looking at a pretty big hit to uh, a lot of Americans. Okay, now, so President Obama said, "Well, we need to bail them out." Well, you guys have heard of United Airlines, right? Did you know that they've been bankrupt before? You've heard of Chrysler? They've been bankrupt before. Chrysler's still making cars? United's still flying? Yeah. Bankruptcy doesn't mean you're going out of business. If you as an individual, say you're 25 years old and you've racked up uh, $500,000 in debt and you make $50,000 a year. <laughs> How do you pay that back? So one option you have is to declare bankruptcy. Okay. And that will go to the courts, and the courts will decide, okay, well, you're going bankrupt. You're going to have to pay this much to this person, this much to this person, this much to this person, which will probably end up being a fraction of what you owe. But by going bankrupt, will you ever be able to borrow money again? Will anybody loan you money ever again? So even if you get your financial house in order 10 years from now, and you want to buy a house, People are going to know you went bankrupt, and they're like, I'm not lending you money. You don't pay your money back. Okay? So businesses go bankrupt, too. Okay? And then the courts figure out how much they're going to pay their creditors that they owe. And then they stay in business. Okay? So this idea of 25,000 people losing their jobs is just not true. Unless they go out of business. So let's say they do go out. General Motors shuts down. That's horrible, right? Are there other auto manufacturers in the United States? Now, what they're going to do is expand their operations because there is going to be a void. There's going to be uh, a void that needs to be filled with more cars because General Motors sells a lot of cars in this country. So there's going to be a demand. Did Ford run their business into the ground? Do they get a bailout? No, they didn't run their business into the ground. So Ford could expand operations. They're going to need skilled workers where some of these people are going to be able to find jobs. You might have to move. Okay? That's life. Okay? And the auto dealerships, well, they're for Ford and other companies like Toyota and others are going to need more auto dealerships if they're selling more cars. So some of those dealerships might be able to switch over. It's going to hurt. There's going to be pain. Okay? But what government's trying to do here is basically do away with pain. Okay? Now, so what the government does is the U.S. government is going to buy $50 billion worth of General Motors stock, making the government the majority share owner. Now, if you know anything about a company, if you own 51% of the stock, that's a controlling interest. You get to make the decision. If nobody owns 
then you hire a board of directors that runs the company together. Follow me? A lot of public companies. So like Mark Zuckerberg sells Facebook stock, but he controls more than 51% or more than 50%. So he gets to make the decisions for Facebook. Yes? Okay. Now, so $50 billion in stock. So who is now the CEO of government? I mean, General Motors. Barack Obama is, and he will fire the CEO of General Motors and appoint his own re the person he wants to replace him, okay? With this $50 billion, this influx of money, they're going to pay, the government's going to choose, Obama's going to choose which creditors get paid back and which ones don't. So the president is picking winners and losers, okay? Now. The goal here for the government was to sell this stock back once the company got back on their feet for even a profit, break even or profit, okay? They ended up selling the stock back for about $30 billion, taking a $20 billion hit for the American taxpayer, but they didn't, go, they didn't have to go through bankruptcy and General Motors did not fail, they bailed them out, okay? That's a bailout. AIG is a multinational company and we did the same thing, $85 billion, okay? And then there were the banks. Now, I don't know if you remember the housing bubble or know about it. These are some of the largest banks in the world, okay? These are massive institutions, okay? They were in big trouble in 2009. This is as W. Bush is leaving office, Obama's coming into office, and both men said, this is an emergency. We have to bail out these banks, okay? How did the banks get in such trouble? Have any of you guys seen the movie The Big Short? You saw it? I think Mr. Wager shows it in one of his classes. Um, it's about this, this housing bubble, okay, that took place in 2008 and 2009. I don't know how much you know about it, okay? I can't do it in five minutes, okay? But basically, you guys know what a mortgage is, right? Okay. So Congress was really encouraging the banks to give mortgages to people that really weren't qualified to get them. Why? So they could achieve the American dream. There is a racial component to this. I'm going to talk really fast. There's a racial component to this because Congress felt like banks were not lending money to minorities. And so they really encouraged banks, unless they wanted to face lawsuits and investigations, to loan money to more minorities. Okay. When you go to get a loan from a bank, people, they're going to ask you, how much money do you make? How long have you had that job? They're going to look at your credit score. Have you paid your other bills on time throughout history, your credit cards, your, your phone bill, your electric bill? Okay. If you have a strong history of employment and you have enough money and you pay your bills, you're going to have good credit. And so they're going to be willing to loan you money because you've shown an ability to pay it back. Yes? Now, when you start loaning money to people with bad credit, if you're a loan officer, you're looking at numbers, not rates. But Congress felt loan officers were looking at rates. Okay, and maybe some of them have. I don't know. Okay, but so what we started doing was handing out mortgages like they were candy. Okay, and the housing prices in this country were rising. Values of property were rising. Okay, like they are right now. Okay, guys, you want to put your house on the market in Wichita, Kansas? It'll sell in a day. I mean, they're going fast, like hotcakes. It's a, it's a, it's a seller's market right now. People are buying houses. Okay, it's crazy how fast they're going. So, what happens to the value of the property when people want, when there's demand for houses? It's up. When nobody's buying houses, and everybody's trying to sell, the value goes down. You follow me? So this is big. 
So now we got all these people buying houses, and some people can't afford it, and they don't have good credit. So, guys, when you go to get a mortgage, okay, you're going to have an interest rate. Okay, that would be fixed. Most people have fixed interest rates. So mine's at like 3.2%, which is awesome. My parents were paying 13.5% in 1976, which is crazy. Okay, now, right now they're really low. That's why it's easy for people to borrow money and buy houses. Okay, now, for those that had bad credit, they would give what were called variable. I didn't spell that right. Variable. Very. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So variable. So if interest rates go up, so they start you at 4%. If interest rates go up, so does your mortgage interest rate. So if your house payment is $800 a month at 4% and the interest rate goes up to 5%, your mortgage payment goes up to $900. Now, if you were just getting by and able to pay all your bills and then you're running out of money at the end of the month and now all of a sudden your mortgage payment's $100 more a month or say it takes up to 6% and you're paying $1,000 a month, guess what? People aren't going to be able to pay their mortgages and over time there will be foreclosures. In 2009, there were foreclosures all over the country and it was bad. The fastest growing city in America was Las Vegas in the early 2000s. And they were putting up $400,000, $500,000 houses left and right. And then this happened. Now, what the banks, what happened with the banks is they were taking hundreds, say, say 500 mortgages, and selling them. Loan, loaning, loan institutions were selling 500 mortgages on the market, and the banks were buying these mortgages. Now, my mortgage gets paid every month on time. So this is like cash flow for the big banks. Okay, but inside this package of 500, say 150 of these were bad mortgage, these variable rates where people, when the economy started to go down a little bit, were unable and interest rates went up, were unable to make their payments. So these big banks were stuck with all these bad mortgages. In other words, when they were foreclosed on, the banks were stuck with all these houses. Okay, and they were in deep doo-doo. Okay, so the government said we got to bail them out to the tune of about a trillion dollars. Now, Lehman Brothers did not get bailed out. Bank of America and Goldman Sachs did. If you go back and look at people that worked in the Obama administration, how many formerly worked at Goldman Sachs? There was a bunch of them in the Obama administration, but not so much for Lehman Brothers. So now the government's picking winners and losers. Lehman Brothers no longer exists. Okay. Now, I don't know what would have happened if these banks went under. It would have been bad because businesses borrow money every day from these banks. Who's going to loan them the money? What's going to happen to the economy? So it scared the crap out of everybody, and we did. This and this are a little bit. This was called TARP, if you want to look it up. Okay? Sam? That's what it is. It's just like if they you have to you're making bad investments. But yeah. The mortgage is disclosed on how good they are. Yes, bad, really bad investment. So the movie, uh, the, the uh, what was it, short, what did I call it? The big short. These guys bet against the banks and won. These investors. They bought short. I, know, I can't explain it. But here it is. This is a new terminology in America. Too big to what? Fail. Fail. So the government says, if you're a big corporation, you run it into the ground. You mismanage it. If you're a big corporation, we won't let you fail. We're going to bail you out. Now, is that a good message to send a big business? No. All right. You guys decide on that one. Peace.